He's a singer-songwriter who sold over 30 million albums worldwide, winner of three Grammys, two Emmys, not to mention multiple Tony nominations for his work on Broadway. My next guest used the COVID isolation for inspiration, quite literally. He joins me tonight to talk about his brand new album, Alone With My Faith, out March 19th. Please welcome back to the program my fellow New Orleanian, Harry Connick Jr. Harry, great to be with you. It's good to be with you, too. Thanks for having me. Hey, great to have you back on the show. I'm upset we can't do this in person. But before we get to the new album, Alone With My Faith, how has this pandemic affected you personally? It had to be rough not having that audience in the band within reach or in regular contact. You know, to be quite honest with you, as much as I love music and I love my band, the last thing on my mind is is performing. You know, what was really tough is you know, the, the loss, um, lost a lot of people in my friend and family circle over the last year and, and, you know, not being able to celebrate their lives or, you know, grieve in a, in a normal way has been, has been pretty tough. But that said, it's been, um, a year of unexpected surprises and blessings. So it's been unusual, but, but it's, it's turned out pretty well in many ways too. Mm -hmm. You did stay connected to your audience through your hunker down with Harry episodes on YouTube. I've seen a few of those. How how did producing those episodes keep you grounded? Um, I think that I, I didn't need to be kept grounded. I mean, it was, it was you know, a pandemic. So, you know, nobody mm -hmm. was thinking about anything except, you know, the, the, the safety and, and well-being of of others. Uh, I, I just wanted to do something that maybe gave people a little bit of a break, gave them some um some entertainment because at that time, you know, last March, you know, nobody really knew what was happening. So I right. figured, let me, let me do something in real time um, with, with people asking questions and giving them some entertainment that was, that was specially made for them. And, and uh, I just hope that for the people who saw it, it gave them a little bit of a break, maybe some comfort. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, it was again, that connection is important, I think, particularly when people were so at sea during the early days of this pandemic. At what point did you start feeling the inspiration to record this new music? And did you know right away what you wanted to record? Well, I knew I, I always wanted to do a gospel album just because I love so many of those great songs. And I never really mm -hmm. got around to it because there were, there's a lot of other things I want to do, too. So when I got home, I have a studio at home and I have a lot of instruments that I've collected over the past 30 years. And I thought, well, maybe this is a good time to do that. So I started recording some familiar songs like um, Old Rugged Cross and Amazing Grace. And then I started thinking, well, what about writing some music that describes how I'm feeling right now? And to be quite honest with you, sometimes um, I, I, I felt OK and other times I, I was questioning a lot of things. And so I wrote about faith from many different perspectives. And so this album turned into an album of faith uh, as opposed to just a, a Christian gospel album. Although it does have Christian songs on it, it's really an album that's made for, for me to help me get through this time and, and to give some, some folks out there a little peace of mind too. Mm -hmm. Well, look, uh, what I love about it is you set up all your own microphones, you played all the instruments, acted as your own engineer. I mean, Paul McCartney did something similar with his new album. Uh, and you recorded all of this uh, uh, at a time when you know everybody's broken up, you can't get together, you can't come together. And for a musician, that interplay and collaboration really is at the heart of what you do. Um, by doing this all yourself, was this just a function of lockdown or was it by design because it is so intimate and the whole album feels very intimate here? Well, it is really intimate and, and it is, it, it's, um, it, it happened as a result of not being able to communicate with anyone, uh, which is why there were no other musicians here or, you know, no recording engineer. But, you know, I, I played solo mm -hmm. so much my whole life that it feels real comfortable to me. I've never done an entire mm -hmm. album where I do everything. I've done songs in the past where you know, I put 30 vocals down or I uh, play all the instruments on a song here or there. But this was the first time when I literally did everything. And and that was uh, mm -hmm. only because there was no other option. And I'm I'm glad I had a chance to do it because I don't know, you know, when that time would have come. Right. 
Why Songs of Faith and Devotion? And what inspired you to explore this sacred ground? Was it because of that, um, the isolation that you and so many of us were going through, that it caused introspection and you thought, this is where I should be focusing my musical energies now? I thought so, you know, pretty much. I, I think that's the reason because, you know, as, as I was going through it, just like you and everyone else, there, there were times for me that, that, that I really struggled. I mean, I think the, the amount of people that I lost that I know, family or friends over the last year is up to 14, um, most wow. of which were as a result of uh, complications from COVID. So there were many days where, you know, you, you, can't, you can't go to funerals, you can't do anything. So, so I, you yeah. know, I had a lot of time to think about my faith, about my spirituality, um, and it, it, it put my faith to the test in the best of ways, because those are the times when I really need it. So uh, it felt mm -hmm. natural for me to sing songs about it. And the songs that I was singing actually helped get me through, which is what they're designed to do. So it was it was an experience that <clears throat> probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. But I sure I'm glad it did. Yeah. I remember interviewing Aaron Neville years ago, and he said during his you know, battles with drugs, he would always sing Lovely Lady Dressed in Blue, and he'd sing it to himself. And it was a prayer that became, he said, medicine for my soul. You know, it, it, it soothed him through that rough patch. And it seems we all need that. Now, I want to give people a little taste of this album, Harry. Uh, this is the new single available now, Harry Connick Jr. singing Amazing Grace. Listen. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did You did everything here. You did vocals, you did drums at the end, their horns. Um, how did you pull all of this off? I mean, did you do, is this electronic or did you actually play the instruments themselves? Well, it was really important for me to use real instruments. Um, as we all know, like you can use garage band and there's fake trumpets and fake guitars, but I didn't do any of that. The trumpet you hear, the mm -hmm. bass, the vocals, the guitars, the saxophones, the trombones, everything is a real instrument. And I started most of the time with a piano track, then I'd add bass and drums, and then I'd add the trumpet or the tenor or whatever mm -hmm. other instrument I was playing. Um, and it's a time consuming process because you have to actually play the instrument. You have to make sure it sounds good on the microphone. Then you have to edit things together and mix it. And so it takes, it takes a while, but uh, I loved every part of that process just because that's, you know, that's what I do. Well, you're an orchestrator, you're a, you're a, a composer. I mean, it, it, it does tax all of your talents here. And you're pulling from a new place in this album, I have to say, just listening and having listened to you for a long time. There's no shortage of Amazing Grace covers out there. Why did you decide to do that song at this time, as well as Panos Angelicus, which you end the album with? Well, I did Panos Angelicus because my dad told me to. <laughs> He said, you're going to record <laughs> a good Panos Angelicus on the album? I'm like, of course I am. I had always planned on that, and <laughs> I hadn't planned on it, but I'm, I'm glad I did it. Um, Amazing Grace was one of the ones that just popped into my mind. I figured even though I couldn't be with people and, and um, <clears throat> couldn't really talk about what was going on, th this song is a song that everyone knows, and I thought that would kind of bring us together to sort of balance out some of the new songs. Um, but as far mm -hmm. as the other songs like Old Rugged Cross... I just love that song. My stepmom, Londa, asked me if I was recording old, old Time Religion, and I said, of course I am, but I hadn't planned on that one either. Um, so a couple of them were, were because I had some, some people in my life that suggested them that wanted to hear them. 
Tell me about the originals. Where did they come from? What's your favorite? I think my favorite is the title track, Alone With My Faith. This song came uh, because I was alone, but I felt like I had my faith with me, so that made it a lot easier. Um, there are certain lines in there like, um, I got to work a little harder right now. I got to little, dig a little deeper. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I've always known that I'm eternally faithful, so I'm never alone. I just wrote how I felt and how I felt other people might feel, and I think um, I think that kind of sums up the whole the whole uh, feeling of this album. Yeah, yeah. No, it's real and essential, and it feels uh, it's something we need. It lifts it lifts spirits as well as acknowledges what we've all lived through and continue to live through. What elements make a great song, Harry? You just did a Broadway show uh, right before this pandemic dedicated to the music of Cole Porter. Um, tell me about not only the songs you selected for that show, but how you choose the songs for all your albums. What makes a great song for Harry Connick? That's a, that's a great question. Um, for me, th there's, there's three basic components to it. There are the lyrics, mm -hmm. there's the melody, and then there are the harmonies or the chords that go with them. The lyrics and the melody are the most important things. And um, I think um, making uh, writing a melody that's singable and, and something that you can remember is, is, is a good quality. Um, having lyrics that, that can touch you emotionally or maybe make you laugh or cry or, or th there's some wit involved, you know, it just depends on the type of song. The, the reason Cole Porter was so great among many reasons is is he wrote both the words and the music but but his right. songs were always a little bit different he he did things in unorthodox ways that that made them interesting and made them kind of uh more more memorable um and and yeah i mean you're talking about one of the great songwriters of of all time so you know i can only dream of being able to 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 write songs on that level but he was he was amazing. It was it's a thrill to sing his songs. Yeah. In, in that album and in this current album, in fact, I go back to your Christmas albums and say the same thing. When you orchestrate a song, there are strong and complex counter melodies uh, beneath them that that even musicians say, wow, you know, this and they're they're subtle, but the. It's this is complex. Your orchestrations are not ba da ba da ba da ba da. I mean, you don't, you know, write the expected. How taxing is that? Where does that come from? And why create those strong counter melodies in an orchestration? Well, let me compliment you on the question. That, that's it's it's you know it's amazing that that you know you you would ask that um, for your viewers who who may not know. It, it's kind yeah. of like. Um, writing the other half of a conversation. You have the melody, you have the lyrics, mm -hmm. and what can I do to, to, to accompany that? What kind of melodies can I write in addition to the melodies, or what kind of chords can I put, or what kind of instrumentation, you know, is it gonna be brass mm -hmm. or strings or woodwinds? Um, in terms of where it comes from, it's not taxing, it's just about identifying with who I am and not trying to be anybody else. I've, I've, I've studied the music of Duke Ellington and Nelson Riddle among Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's about what is the song trying to say? And I, I heard somewhere that my arrangement of In the Still of the Night was bothersome to this one particular person. And she said that mm. the song is called In the Still of the Night. And you have this giant <clears throat> big band section in the middle. Do you not know what the song means? And I didn't respond, but my answer would be, in the still of the night, this person is going insane, uh, you know, mm. wondering if the person that he loves is reciprocating his love, which is why the thoughts been out of control and it, and it bursts into this thing. It's not really about the still of the night. It's about losing your mind, wondering if that person loves you. So I think about what the lyrics mean, and I start with a blank page, I don't know what the tempo is going to be. I don't know what the key is going to be. I don't know what the groove is going to be. Is it going to be a ballad? Is it going to be up tempo? And then I just start thinking of stuff, and you know, and then it eventually takes takes shape. And then you have the ability to go back and and edit it and and refine it. Mm -hmm. you, you've called the experience of working on this current album um, a, a musical isolation chamber 
or a silent retreat. And I want to tie this to what you were just saying. Did this deepen your faith, your Catholic faith in particular, working on these songs in that isolation chamber? Such a, it's another great question. It, it does. It really is like a retreat. It's like, it's like a retreat where you go there to exercise the gift that you've been given by God that compels you to communicate with him. And when I was alone, and, and, and when you sing on a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, when you sing that, and then you sing it again, and you sing it again, you, you really start to, to feel it. It takes, takes you over. And I think mm -hmm. that feeling is a deepening of faith because I'm, I'm singing about something that's referring to faith and I'm feeling more connected to God. And I think that's what's happening. I think, I think that is actually a deepening of faith. It's a, it's a, it's a real time confirmation of what the song is about. So yeah, I think, I think it is a, mm -hmm. a deepening of, of faith. Well, and, and I would argue, and you mentioned it a moment ago, when you're working, you know, when you look at that blank page and you're crafting a, an orchestration and taking something so established and known in the public's mind and you're refashioning it and working it through your own experience, th that, that itself is its own retreat. I mean, I know from working on books, you, you get into that zone and then there's Same the thing. stuff you never planned for, Harry. There's the, you know, the Holy Spirit, yep. if I could give it a name. Um, and that's what I hear in between that's the cracks the of this album. You know, you, you're articulating it far more eloquently than, than I could. It's, it's exactly right. My dad has dedicated his life to understanding the Holy Spirit and written a thing called the Spiritual Mysteries, um, and it's amazing. And that's, that's what I think it is. It's like that little tap mm -hmm. on your shoulder that maybe yep. says, hey, write this down. You know, it's got to come from somewhere. And, and I, think yep. that's, I think that's what it is. Now, you got to the point in this album where you were ready for the final mix, but you didn't do that in your house. You rented an RV, you drove home to New Orleans to do the final mix. Why was it important for you to finish Alone With My Faith here in our hometown of New Orleans? Because I, I realized my limitations and a mixing engineer is a, is a, a, is a skill set that I do not possess. So. Uh, my, my good friend, Tracy Freeman, with whom I went to uh, Jesuit High School, lives probably five minutes from where you're sitting right now in Metairie, and he <laughs> um, is, a, is a brilliant uh, mixing engineer. So I said, Tracy, I'm going to drive down, I'm going to get tested, and I'm going to go into your studio, and we're going <laughs> to mix this thing. And, and that's, you know, that, that's beyond, you know, my job description. So I was glad to have Glad to have Tracy in my life to make it sound like a record. Well, and in the place where all that faith originated in many ways for you. Uh, so I, I, I loved that, yep, that there was absolutely. that local touch. Speaking of New Orleans this year, for, for many, this was the first Mardi Gras that was essentially canceled. Now, I know the mayor's office said it wasn't canceled, but the fact is we didn't have parades. We didn't do anything. Uh, you were one of the founders of the crew of Orpheus, which I've ridden in. How did this absence of Mardi Gras, Harry, affect you? People outside of New Orleans don't fully understand this, what it means to us and the rhythm of life. I think, you know, if I missed Mardi Gras because of a personal issue or if you missed it because of a personal issue, it would be disappointing. Come back next year. But the fact that we all missed it, it's kind of OK. I mean, I know there's varying opinions about Mayor Cantrell and how she's handled the situation. I, for one, support her because we have to stop this, this virus. I mean, it's hard on everyone. It's, it's mm -hmm. especially the people who are out there in the front lines and the essential workers. But, you know, yep. we're, I believe we're going to make it through. But, but you know, you, you, you can't have Mardi Gras. And it is what it is, man. You know, we, we, we're, we're, we're OK. You know, we made it. it. You know, we would love to go out there and, and party. But, you know, I think for everyone's benefit, it's probably best that we sat that one out, you know? Okay, well, hopefully we'll all get back together this upcoming year, Harry. At least that's my hope. Uh, before I go I very so. quickly, 
I, I couldn't leave without mentioning uh, a, a friend of both of ours, um, New Orleans jazz icon, Ellis Marcellus, really the patriarch of jazz here in uh, New Orleans. He was one of those whose lives were claimed by COVID over the last year. I know he meant a great deal to you personally. Very quickly, what did he teach you as a mentor, as a musician? So much. I mean, if you, if you extract all of the, the musical stuff and put that aside, just who he was as a man um, and, mm -hmm. and the type of work ethic that he instilled in me. I mean, I got a lot of that from my parents, um, but r r specifically regarding music, nobody worked harder than Ellis. Um, and then you look at his sons, Winton and Bramford, um, unbelievable work ethic. So, I, you know, the, the idea that, um, I mean, this, this, guy, this guy gave up going on the road with Earth, Wind & Fire to be a jazz musician in, in, in New Orleans and raise six kids. Yeah. He, he's, he, he was an amazing man. I think about him every day, and I'm so honored that we have the Ellis Marsalis Center for Music to carry on his name and his legacy, because he was, he was so dear to me and you and the city of New Orleans, and yeah. you know I look forward to seeing Ellis monuments all over New Orleans and you know Ellis Marsalis Avenue and stuff like that. I agree. Here, here. Okay, we will leave it there, Harry. The new album, Alone With My Faith, it really does feel like a retreat, uh, but a j very joyous one and a, an intimate uh, personal one in so many ways. It hits stores Friday, March 19th. The new single, Amazing Grace, is available now on Apple Music, Spotify, all the usual outlets. Harry, my friend, thanks for being with us. We'll do it again soon, hopefully in person. I hope so. You're a really smart guy and a sensitive guy, and, and I, I really enjoyed our time together. Thanks for having me back. Me too. See you soon. Bye, Harry.